All right. Hi, and welcome to uh, Red Reviews. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> shit. No, that's not the right one. This is the one we want. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> this is the one. Hi, and welcome to Red Reviews. <laughs> <laughs> the podcast where I apparently don't know where what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how's it going, Corey? Not too bad. How's it going? Not too bad. Can't complain. It's been nice and sunny here. Um, yeah. And uh, this is like the first relatively normal week I've had in a while. It's been a very busy month for me between two um, speaking engagements and conferences and going to a wedding and all kinds of stuff. Excuse me, all kinds of stuff. So it's been super busy. Wow. So I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to a less busy June. Although June's starting out with a bang because the first Saturday in June is my my niece's high school graduation. So they go into that. So that'll be a big to do. But that's about it. That's about it. Um, So tonight we're kind of picking up on a similar theme that we discussed in the last um, you know episode when we discussed Lizette Kalikowski's book. on uh, Marxist humanism in right. defense of Marxist humanism. Um, and the, we're going to kind of stay in that wheelhouse of the sort of the Marxist humanist tradition. And tonight we'll be talking about sort of my favorite thinker within the sort of the pantheon of Marxist humanism. And that's Eric Fromm. Um, Eric cool. Fromm was a psychologist, um, a psychoanalyst. He was in the sort of the Freudian tradition. Um, but he also radically reinterpreted Freud and psychoanalysis to be more humanistic, um, and be more, um, I guess sort of less orthodox in the way that Freud could be quite orthodox. Um, and, uh, and so he was somebody who was very interested in sort of the intersection of Freud and the sort of psychoanalytical tradition and Marxism. Um, he was exposed to Marxism at a very young age, um, probably in his teens. Um, and like many thinkers in the Marxist humanist tradition, he's very much enamored with the early writings of Marx. Um, okay. So the book that we're discussing tonight is Marx's Concept of Man, um, which is a book that Eric Fromm put together, um, I think sometime in like the 1950s um, or 1960s. And this, the, the, First part of the book is a long extended essay that he wrote, which is Marx's concept of man. And then the back half of the book, most of the book is actually Marx's own writing. So tonight we're sort of doing a two, it's a, it's a one, two punch of, of talking about stuff. So we're also going to be talking about Karl Marx's economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844. Oh, wow. um, Which up until the 1960s, when they were translated, um, wasn't really available for most of the English speaking world. Um, And so uh, in the 1960s, these uh, manuscripts um, were translated um, and Frome wrote essentially a commentary on them and makes the argument very much like I do, where there's, there's sort of two schools of thought. We've talked about this before, but for those who are new, um, you know, there's the sort of two schools of thought about Marx and humanism that sort of there's the early Marx versus the late Marx, where people argue people like Althusser and others that like there's a clear like theoretical break between Marx's early work and Marx's late work. Right. And what the Marxist humanists argue is that that's not necessarily true, that if you look at uh, his early body of writings and the later part of the writings that there's actually kind of a through line between his early work, like the economical and philosophical manuscripts and a later work, more sort of organized and cohesive work like capital. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's writing capital in his like forties and fifties. He's writing the economic and philosophical manuscripts in his, I guess would be his twenties. Okay. Yeah. So there's um, yeah. lots of time there. So yeah. Some people might change some by uh, and he definitely like evolved and changed. But like, but there is a consistent theme, which is that, you know, contrary to, I think, a lot of the ways in which Marx has been, you know, sort of interpreted in the world. um, I think that he first and foremost is a philosopher of human freedom. I think that Mm. this is the thing about Marx. I think that people they sort of miss because of the way that in which Leninism 
sort of shaped the future of Marxism, especially in the 20th century. Right. Um, that Marx necess wasn't necessarily like what would become the Soviet Union. I think that there's an argument to be made that if had Marx lived, I think he would have kind of been appalled right. by what the Soviet Union kind of became. Um, and so that's the kind of position that Fromm has, where Fromm is extremely critical of capitalism and the sort of consumerist society and the sort of the numbing and and sort of uh, deadening effects of consumer culture and uniformity. But at the same time, he's also very critical of state capitalist systems like the Soviet Union or state socialist systems like the Soviet Union or China, who in many ways have a lot of this, in his view, have a lot of the same sort of oppressive structures and, and deadening and uniforming structures that capitalism has. Mm. And so he sort of, in the beginning of the book, he sort of says in the preface, he says, the alternatives for the underdeveloped countries whose political development will be decisive for the next hundred years are not capitalism and socialism, but totalitarian socialism versus Marxist humanist socialism, as it tends to develop in various forms in Poland, Yugoslavia, Egypt, Burma, Indonesia, etc. And so um, he's, he's arguing there that we have to sort of abandon some of these more totalitarian manifestations of Marxism and sort of get back to the essence of what Marx was about, which was essentially as a philosopher of human freedom and humanism. Right. Um, and so uh, as he kind of says in the beginning of the, the, the book, um, you know, Marx's philosophy, like much of existentialist thinking, which is like Jean-Paul Sartre and others, represents a protest against man's alienation, his loss of himself, and his transformation into a thing. It is a movement against the dehumanization and automization of man, inherent in the development of Western industrialism. It is ruthlessly critical of all answers to the problem of human existence, which try to present solutions by negating or camouflaging the dichotomies inherent in man's existence. Marxist philosophy is rooted in the humanist Western philosophical tradition, which reaches from Spinoza through the French and German Enlightenment philosophers of the 18th century to Goethe and Hegel, and the very essence of which is concern for man and the realization of his potentialities. Because that's what humanism is. So, like, obviously there's, like, gendered language there, so we can broad it out. But, like, basically humanism is a project. The broadest sense of it is a philosophy that is dedicated to the, the potential and flourishing of human beings. That's what it's about. And so Frome is looking at, in the 1960s, he's writing this in the early 1960s. So he's looking at the world and kind of seeing multiple forms of totalitarianism, where it's the sort of capitalist totalitarian of, totalitarianism of the West, right. which alienates people from their work, which alienates people from themselves, and alienates people from others, in sort of Marx's language. And... But he's also looking at the Soviet Union and he's looking at China and he's seeing that a lot of the same structures of uniformity and oppression are sort of manifesting themselves in those systems too. And he mm. is – he's not as comfortable with the sort of apologetics around that that other Marxists would do. Um, okay. And so, yeah. And so, I can appreciate uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> And so he says, um, the reason he also wrote this book too is because he wants to write it as largely an antidote to two things that were going on at the same time. One is the sort of demonization of Marxism in right. the capitalist West and what he saw as the sort of distortion, distortion of Marxism in the sort of socialist East. And, and so when we we're kind of looking at it that way, um, it's I think it's it's very interesting. I think the other thing about what makes Frome interesting too is that he also recognizes the limitations within Marxism. Mm. So as he writes in the preface, he says, you know, um a number of, of disagreements do exist concerning his his, meaning Marx, sociological and economic theory, some of which I've expressed in previous works. And he's talking about books like because Mar Eric Frome's probably most famous book is called Escape from Freedom. 
It's okay. kind of a classic text of 20th century social thought. It's kind of up there with Sartre's anti-Semite and Jew or Theodore Adorno's The Authoritarian Personality or okay. like um, Eric Hoffer's The True Believer. It's a book that kind of tries to use political theory and psychology to understand where did fascism come from? Okay. Where did totalitarianism come from? Um, it's a good project. <laughs> it's a very interesting project. But he says here in terms of his limitations, they refer mainly, meaning his criticisms, refer mainly to the fact that Marx failed to see the degree to which capitalism was capable of modifying itself and thus satisfying the economic needs of industrialized nations. His failure to see clearly enough the dangers of bureaucratization and centralization mm. and to envision the and to envision and to envisage the authoritarian systems which can emerge as alternatives to socialism. Um, I think this is really interesting. I think it ties into our episode we did about libertarian socialism, the yeah. critique of bureaucracy, the critique of top-down structures, right? Um, this is where I think anarchists have legitimate criticisms of, um, of Marx and Marxism properly, um, is that Marx didn't necessarily always account for the ways in which systems can sort of uh, – reemerge and change um, and sort of save themselves despite right. being so terrible. Yeah. And I, I find like, there's actually like, maybe I, I just wasn't exposed to it before, but we've, we've covered quite a few now Marxists who acknowledge that this is a limitation in some way or that yep. like this, like this is what happened because of this uh, focus on centralization, this focus on bureaucracy and uh Yeah. There, it's not it's not an unknown criticism among Marxists anymore. Yeah, and I think it's it's a pretty mainstream thing, and I think that Marx himself would have done the same thing. I mean, I right. think that Marxism is not this like dead dogma. It's very much this like living, breathing thing which changes with changes in material conditions. That's the point. Right. And and I think that you know. That's what I think Frome is also reacting to as well, is the sort of dogmatization of Marxism by uh, the Soviets and by other sort of, um, you know, Leninists who um, sort of concretized and sort of systematized Marxism in such a way that um, it became sort of the true religion of those societies. Right, right. Yeah. Um, for atheistic, for atheist societies or what have you, like, yeah, it became almost a religion on, in itself, in and of itself. <sighs> exactly. And so, yeah, and he actually even writes about this a little bit in his book. He says, another reason lies in the fact that the Russian communists appropriated Marxist theory and tried to convince the world that their practice and theory follow his ideas. Um Although the opposite is true, the West accepted their propagandistic claims and has come to assume that Marxist position corresponds to the Russian view and practice. However, the Russian communists are not the only ones guilty of misinterpreting Marx. While the Russians' brutal contempt for individual dignity and humanistic values is indeed specific for them, the misinterpretation of Marx as the proponent of an economic hedonistic materialism has also been shared by many of the anti-communist and reformist socialists. So he's getting into one of the criticisms of Marx, which is that it's a very deterministic philosophy that like Marx says, basically, if you follow these specific steps, you'll get to this system, this mm. new society. And that it's kind of inevitable. Um, and yeah. it's, it's also <clears throat> a rejection of sort of crass materialism where when we refer to materialism, we're referring to it. And when Marx was referring to it, in the philosophical sense of referring to like the real world and dealing right. with real like material reality. Whereas materialism is sort of generally understood as like the accumulation of stuff yeah, yeah. or the obsession with the accumulation of stuff. Um, yeah. It's kind of like consumerism, not just like materialism. Right. Exactly. And, you know, and, and it's, so he's getting into a lot of this, with the sort of view of materialism and there's part of the chapter from from is discussing Marx's historical materialism where um, he says Marx fought the this type of mechanical bourgeois materialism the abstract materialism of natural science that excludes history and its process and postulated instead what he called in the economic and philosophical manuscripts naturalism or humanism 
mm. which is distinguished from both idealism and materialism, and, and at the same time constitutes their unifying truth. Um, this is really interesting. So, like, Marx is as developing this synthesis of sort of idealistic philosophy on one hand, of sort of, you know, of the German idealists like Hegel. And then you have on the other side of it, the sort of bourgeois materialists of the Enlightenment, specifically of like the Scottish or French Enlightenment. Right. And his philosophy is the blending of the two, where instead of seeing the world merely as ideas or merely as stuff, it's seeing things as ideas as manifested through the reality that we experience. Right. Um, and I think that that's pretty darn close to what <laughs> is kind of reality. I think that, you know, no matter how much we, we, we as humans cannot like see everything about reality as it is. Right. Everything is mediated through concepts, right? But those concepts have to correspond to something. Yeah. And so Marx is arguing for reality or our concepts to correspond to reality rather than reality conforming to our concepts. Mm -hmm. This is where you get the idea of, um, you know, like the idea of with Hegel, it's about going from heaven to earth, meaning that you're going from the ideal to the real. And Marx is earth to heaven, where it's you're going from the real to the ideal, think, where you're developing concepts based on, am I, uh, hopefully I'm saying that right. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think I'm, I'm just, uh, I think it was philosophy tube just, uh, put out a, a video on the Stoics. Oh, interesting. And, and they kind of had like the Stoics kind of had like a, a, an idea about conforming your ideas about the world to reality as well. <laughs> so exactly. Like, yeah. The best you live the best life if you acknowledge reality as reality. <laughs> exactly. So, like here, um, Frome writes in contrast to Hegel, Marx studies man in history by beginning with the real man and the economic and social conditions under which he must live, and not primarily with his ideas. Marx was as far from bourgeois materialism as he was from Hegel's idealism. Hence, he could rightly say that his philosophy is neither idealism nor materialism but a synthesis, humanism and naturalism. So naturalism, which is like another component of this too, had had he lived long enough to see him develop, I think Marx would have had a lot of affinity for the American philosopher John Dewey okay. um, and the pragmatist tradition, because it kind of is very similar to this, where the naturalist philosophy is a pragmatic one, where we recognize the limitations of experiential um, inputs. Yeah. And we and we also recognize that the way that we mediate reality through concepts and through language and yeah. that those things go hand in hand. Um, I think that's I think it's kind of interesting. And I think it's like I said, I think it's far closer to reality than what either way is. Yeah, this was often like, uh, I mean, maybe not. Maybe I'm misinterpreting mis uh, it, but I I always thought that this was kind of like why. Postmodernism isn't an a hundred percent anti-Marxist, and vice versa, because the acknowledgement that we are our access to true reality is limited is kind of a thing that both all both of those things promote, right? Like, I mean, postmodernism did its own thing, but right? <laughs> but, but yeah, no, I don't think you get to a lot of the postmodernist thought without him. I mean, right. without Marx. I think I think a lot of it comes from Marx, a lot of it comes from Freud, and a lot of it comes from Wittgenstein. So with mm -hmm. Freud, it's understanding the the concepts of the unconscious and the ways right. in which the human brain is often alien to us, and that human <laughs> motivations are immensely complicated and not always fit into neat boxes. With Marxism, it's about the analysis of material conditions and history, and yeah. history being a very prime force in understanding humanity. And then with Wittgenstein, it's the the, the centrality of language. Yeah, how language plays that. a crucial part, what he called yeah. language games, right? So all of those go hand in hand to develop postmodernism. The big difference is that Marxism is essentially a modernist philosophy and that right. it does actually accept large meta narratives about the world, whereas right. whereas postmodernism does not. Yeah. And this is where you get into, um, you know, critiques of postmodernism from, you know, Marxists like Frederick Jameson or Terry Eagleton, who sort of make the argument that, um, or at least Jameson does, um, that postmodernism is essentially what he calls the cultural logic of late capitalism. 
Mm. Um, where because you know capitalism is essentially content agnostic it doesn't really give a fuck what you believe right yeah it, it only is just it you know it only matters what um it only really matters what makes money and what doesn't those as are long as you're things. productive and you as make long as you're productive and generating a profit it doesn't really yeah. matter what you believe right yeah. and this is how capitalism can be not just immoral in the sense of doing harm intentionally, we could also be deeply and is at its base is amoral. It doesn't yeah. really have a moral valence to it because it doesn't care. Yeah. Um, because it's it's its value sets are very different than what we would expect from uh, a more humanistic worldview like socialism or, right. or anarchism. So it's it's so that's a part of that. And but I do think your point's well taken that I think that that there's a kernel of truth in the way that people misrepresent Marxism and postmodernism, and but but to sort of lumping them in in the way that yeah. people like Jordan Peterson does, wow, that's or right. that's wrong too. Right do. <laughs> that's also wrong because some of the most vehement critics of postmodernism are Marxists. Yeah. I mean, there are people right. who because postmodernism is also in many respects is a very anti-science philosophy, whereas Marxism is deeply pro-science. Right. Um, and, and deeply pro development. That's kind of, again, you know, pro science, pro economic development, pro, um, you know, basically pro progress in, in, in the bigger sense. Um, but where I think, uh, and where we can kind of go with that is thinking about how, um, Marxism is essentially a philosophy that blends the individual and society. Mm -hmm. So there's this sort of false dichotomy of neoliberalism where, you know, every yeah. man's an island. There's no such thing as society. Everybody's just atomized individuals. Yeah. Then there's the sort of collectivism of totalitarianism, which completely subsumes individuality and individual choice um, and individual sort of human flourishing for yeah. the party or the mass or whatever. Yeah. And Marxism kind of rejects both of those and argues that they kind of go together and that in many respects, we make our own history. Um, right. So, you know, so as from Rice, he says, it is very important to understand Marx's fundamental idea. Man makes his own history. Human beings make their own history. They are their own creator. As, as he put it many years later in Capital, and would not so such a history be easier to compile since, as Vico says, human history differs from natural history in this, that we have made the former, but not the latter. Humanity gives birth to itself in the process of history. The essential factor in this process of self-creation of the human race lies in its relationship to nature. Humanity at the beginning of its history is blindly bound or chained to nature. In the process of evolution, it transforms its relationship to nature and, and hence itself. So like, this is, this is like really crucial stuff here. So we're talking mm -hmm. about human beings, what makes us fundamentally different. Um, and uh, I kind of changed the language a little bit in the quote, just to make it more non-gendered, but, but, um, but uh, to, you know, we transform reality, like in a, in a way that other, other animals don't, so right. we as human animals are consciously aware of our transformation of reality. So like we transform, you know, trees into paper or into wood for houses. We transform, um, you know, plants into consumable food for us to live. These are things that we actively do that we yeah. think about and we develop ways to do that. Every other animal on earth pretty much doesn't really do that. They all are right. kind of driven more by drives. And while we are driven by drives, we are also capable of reason. And the ability to change the earth and to do things with our hands or our brains is what separates us apart. And that's what makes us unique um, and makes us kind of special in a way that other things aren't. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're better than anybody else or anything else. It's just that's what makes us different. Right. And in that regard – we have the capacity for agency. And so the goal of socialism is the advancement of human agency, in my estimation, and in Fromm's. Like, I think if you look at what anybody on the left would see as a viable project is, is developing a society where we are shared, we have shared collective goals, whether it's the elimination of poverty, the elimination of human misery, these, you know, that the the, uh, the uh, limiting of you know, getting rid of want, you know, solving the, the broader crises. But at the same time, why are we doing all of that? 
Yeah. We're not doing it just to make ourselves feel good, although that's a nice benefit to it too. <laughs> yeah. But we're doing it to expand the capacities of freedom. Yeah. Because human beings are capable of that way that other creatures are not. Right. We are, we're far more capable of expanding our sphere of agency than others do. Um, and so I think that's really interesting and important. But at the same time, we're also, um, we are also sort of, our lives are sort of determined by the very material processes that we're a part of. Yeah. Yeah. So as from writes, yeah. like, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just, it just makes me think like when you, we imagine ourselves as like uh, having more will over nature or what have you uh, than say a fox or a, a hen or what have you. But then we also, we develop these material conditions that then determine our, you know, our decision-making capacity and place us into uh, like a deterministic kind of like scenario where we don't have will over anything. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm getting a little too into the weeds there, but. No, no, I think that's fair. <laughs> and I think that goes into the idea of, you know, that labor, this is him writing now. He says, labor is the expression of human life and through labor, man's relationship to nature has changed. Hence, through labor, man changes himself. This is this is crucial. This is a really core component of, of Marxism. And that's why the capitalist system is so um, anathema to the human project because it's taking what is such a fundamental part of our lives, which yeah. is to use our hands and brain to do things to improve ourselves and to prove uh, and to improve our lives and improve the lives of others. Yeah. And it takes that very real, very um, humanistic impulse and, and, and cultivated, you know, behavior and it destroys it under the weight of the need for growth and the mm -hmm. need for profits. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's where we get into alienation. And we're going to talk about that more because like the Marxist humanists, especially from are very interested in talking about the concept of alienation, which we've talked about before, um, because it was very important to the situationists as well. When we were talking right. about Guy Debord and others, again, they're also writing the 1960s when the economic and philosophical manuscripts are available for the first time. So people are <laughs> reflecting upon them and the, the, the concepts of alienation really being one of the central themes from the economic and philosophical manuscripts. Right. Um, so because what's really important with that is that people always say with Marxism that it's like, oh, you just want everybody to be equal. And it's like, no, that's not actually the goal. Everybody's different. Yeah. And we should celebrate those differences, right? So for example, I can't do math for shit. Like yeah. I'm not a, I'm not very good at math, but I'm <laughs> but I'm good at reading philosophical texts and, you know, explaining them, at least I like to think I am. And, and some people are really good at math and they couldn't do what I do. Right. Yep. So everybody has strengths and weaknesses. You have strengths that I don't have, and I have strengths you don't have. And that's the whole point of what Marx wrote in the Gotha program, the critique of the Gotha program, when he said from each according to his ability to each according to his need, like right. everybody has different abilities and talents and that's okay. And like in a socialist society, we would celebrate those differences. We wouldn't try to spurn them. Exactly. Like, yes, I want to define how equal, right? Like <laughs> it's uh, some random geek has a, a comment. Uh, it is not about equity. It is not about equity, not equality. If I remember. Oh, it is. You about, mean it's about it, equity. It's, it's about, about equity. Yes, not exactly. Equity. exactly. Exactly. That's exactly the point. And so because the real you know, because the real essence of Marx's project is not so much making everybody equal. That's not really always the point. Right. The bigger point is to destroy the alienation in the system of capitalism. They, by abolishing capitalism, we lose that sense of alienation where people can then become connected to their work. They can be then con connected to themselves and they can become connected to others. Right. Because capitalism rips us from those things through the process of alienation. Um, one and too many knots, he says. One too many knots. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, um, so like it's, so he, he, he makes a, he has a really interesting quote where he sort of says something along the lines of like the, the ways in which industrial capitalism and industrial state socialism or state capitalism and Soviet Union really weren't that different. The same kind of alienating processes exist on the auto plant 
in Detroit, right? As they do at the you know steel plant in Vladivostok or whatever. It's the same, you know, the same kind of ways in which um, we we kind of rip ourselves from our own capacity to be individuals. So he writes later, he says, for Marx, the aim of socialism was the emancipation of man. And the emancipation of man was at the same as his self-realization in the process of productive relatedness and oneness with man in nature. The aim of socialism was the development of the individual personality. And that's right. Like, like in general, you know, the goal of, you know, um, the goal is ultimately to then, you know, get to communism. So he writes, right. you know, communism is a fully developed naturalism, is a humanism, is a fully developed naturalism, is humanism, and is a fully developed humanism, is naturalism. It is the definitive resolution of the antagonism between man and nature, between man and man. So like when we get to the society that we seek, you know, the, the, the socialist, the communist society, we are, we are, we've finally resolved the deep antagonisms between ourselves and the world and with ourselves and others that the relationships that have been sort of destroyed and alienated in the system get resolved and real human history begins, which I think is like really interesting. I've, I've always thought that's a very interesting like way of interpreting the world. Like that we're essentially all living in prehistory yeah. and that we, we don't really get to the real meat of human history until we get past capitalism. That I think is a really interesting concept. Yeah. Well, it, and I mean, it is very interesting. Like you say, to see like, where would, where will we go when we reach like, uh, uh, we eliminate exploitation or we eliminate the alienation we have. Yeah. And so he's attacking the sort of what he calls the crude communism, mm. um, Okay. Where he says crude communism is only the culmination of such envy and leveling down on the basis of a preconceived minimum. How little this abolition of private property represents a genuine appropriation is shown by the abstract negation of the whole world of culture and civilization and the regress and regression to the unnatural simplicity of the poor and wantless individual who is, who is not only not surpassed private property, but is not yet even attained to it. So he's, what he's getting at there is the way in which those sort of crude communist societies developed where it was all about um, – I think one of the best examples of this is Kurt Vonnegut's classic short story, Harrison Bergeron. In Harrison Bergeron, Kurt Vonnegut writes about a world where people are by, mandated by the government to be made equal. And so what they do is – so if you're a particularly attractive person, you have to wear a mask. Right. You have to hide yourself because you're too beautiful. Or if you're too tall, they like they like make you hunch down or they cut your legs like off or something right, like that. Right, right. Or if you're, you're tall, you if have you're too short. an unfair advantage, right? Yeah. But, and so it's this yeah. like crude where, oh, everybody's just gonna be equal. And this is a, an absolute distortion. It's a and straw sort of, man of <laughs> a straw man, right? It's not real. But yeah. what Vonnegut's trying to get across is, and what Frome's trying to get across is like when societies sort of think about this in this sort of crude quality way, that's the end, that's the end result. It's right. not because nobody, nobody's going to be perfectly equal. That's not how this works. Yeah. The goal is to build a society where people are free to express themselves and be who they want to be to their highest, yeah. to their highest um, ideas. And the thing is, it's like, well, people would say, well, wouldn't everybody want to have like, billion dollar yachts or another and the answer is no i mean most humans <laughs> most people well then most, most people, people can go fuck themselves like <laughs> most people can either fuck themselves right or the only reason that people care about any of that is because other people do it yeah yeah because so it's other, a race to the top right like because, because it's a race to the yeah, top and it's all that and kind all that. of you know, keeping up with the joneses and all that what most so people want is to go out on a boat and fish every now and then bingo they don't need a, a billion dollar yacht they just need a boat where they can go and fish. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, that's, I think, the big difference of, you know. Some random geek says, I just want a place to live, like an apartment, a good PC to stream Fortnite. There you go. There you go. You know, for me, it's about having a, you know, for me, it's a good home and having you know, good health care and <laughs> to be able to. You know, yeah. have the books I love and have libraries and, and do the things that make me happy. It, uh, when I was in my 
uh, even early 20s, maybe even 19, I used to say, I just want to be able to do whatever I want, which isn't an unreasonable thing. I don't want a bunch of things. I don't want to hunt other people. I just want to go to the movies now and then. Read a book. Be able to afford a book that I want when I want to buy a book. You know, eat outside of the house every now and then. Like, <laughs> just Exactly. Exactly. And you, you brought up the, the, the fishing example. And that always makes me think of when we discuss the economic um, – <laughs> or that pickup truck with the truck nuts. The truck nuts is a very USA thing. Yes, it is. Or it is a very USA it's thing. It's an it's Alberta thing, too. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, it's an Alberta thing. I'm uh, I'm trying to find it here. But but basically, there's a quote that Marx sort of uses to describe. Oh, yeah. There's, there's um, the first part. It's a, he said, uh, uh, it is the society of the spectacle that makes us want something like a Hummer. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And the... Yes. And the way that in which those systems of like commodity fetishism, where we're, we're celebrating the thing, not for what it is, but for what it represents. Right. Yeah. So like, for example, when people buy Nike shoes, people don't buy them because they're either the most comfortable or because they are the most durable or they buy them for the brand. A lot of yeah. people buy things for the brand. Right. And if you need like, you know, and it's like, if you need an indication of like the way in which those commodities become sort of fetishized ideas is when we think of what's called lean production, where the companies that make the Nike shoes are not owned by Nike. Nike mm -hmm. subcontracts out companies and sweatshops to make those shoes and then they have the Nike label on them and then Nike sells them. Right. Nike's real business is not shoes, it's intellectual property. It's the same with Apple, right? Yeah. Apple's business isn't really computers. Apple's business is the brand and the intellectual property they're in. That's, that's the real meat of what makes them valuable. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but Marx has this great quote where he talks about, um, you know, if I, if I want to do all these different things in a day, they don't necessarily make me specific things. So like today, one of the first things people tend to lead with is, you know, what do you do? What is your job? Right. Yep. yep. And, and Marx in the future kind of argues like, well, ideally you wouldn't think of yourself that way. Like your goal is ultimately to think more like, um, I'm going to look it up real quick, okay. but yeah, but basically like, um, we want, we want to live in a world where we get to do all kinds of different things. We're not sort of limited by, yeah, you know, mere right. professions. So he says, you know, in, um, in the introduction to the critique of political economy, he talks about like, which is also part of this book. So this book has mostly the manuscripts, but then it has a bunch of different other things. Okay. Um, but he says, for as soon as the distribution of labor comes into being, each man has a particular exclusive sphere of activity, which is forced upon him and from which he cannot escape. He is a hunter, a fisherman, a herdsman, or a critical critic, and must remain so if he does not want to lose his means of livelihood. While in communist society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes. Society regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. Yeah. This is this is it, right? This is This is that goal where we want to live in a world where – technology and abundance has allowed us a certain level of flourishing in human freedom that would have never been realized in a state of nature, nor could be realized in capitalism. Right. And that's, I think, something we have to think about in this age now where we have artificial intelligence and the emergence of something like chat GBT and the emergence of industrialized production where less and less people will be on the actual working floor of where factories are mostly robots, right? Yeah, that's right. And we should live in a world, ideally, where like all of those things would be great and like celebrated <laughs> and we wouldn't have to worry about it, right? Yeah, it would just um, mean less work days, right? <laughs> it would just mean less work days. You know, the human race, we in our, in this system, we create more than we ever need. We yeah. create enough to feed, clothe, house, and provide medical care to every human being on earth and then some. Yeah. Like we, we, you know, this system 
you know, the reason that people go starving in capitalism is not a failure of production. It's a failure of distribution because capitalism is built upon artificial wants. Yeah. And, and it's built on artificial wants. We were talking earlier, but it's also built upon artificial scarcities that you build into the system fake scarcities yeah. as a means to um, you know, keep prices the way they are so to generate profits. We've all seen the videos of like, you know, places where instead of, you know, giving the clothes out free to the homeless after they're being, you know, priced out or whatever, that they'll take box cutters to them and destroy them. Yeah. Or people throwing perfectly good food into the fire so that it doesn't get used by people. Yeah. Or uh, have- police guarding a dumpster outside of a grocery store because we can't have yeah. people fe- eating for free. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. Capitalism as a function of overproduction, great new cars, graveyards. Exactly. I mean, think of the pandemic. And I think maybe that's what some random geek was also mentioning too, is think of the pandemic when you had the, the, the chip shortage. Yeah. And all of these new brand new cars needed microchips yeah. to make them work. So you'd have tons of cars just sitting around that nobody could drive or nobody could produce because they'd have chips in them. Yeah. When in Kokomo, Indiana, about an hour and a half north of where I live, about an hour north of where I live, where I went to to college and where I lived for a number of years. Um, there's a Chrysler plant there. There's also a GM plant there where they install electronics. Mm. And I, during the pandemic, you just saw rows and rows and rows of cars and trucks that were just parked ass to ass in these giant parking lots because they needed chips that <sighs> they couldn't get. Yeah. And part of that's because the United States moved away from having its own production facilities and having a lot of stuff go to China. And so right. because of that, we didn't have the capacity to build things like microchips or ventilators. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and so that's, you know, in many ways, that's kind of the end goal. And the other part of it, I think that's really interesting too, is Marx's like, his like view of spirituality, I think is really interesting too. Okay. So this comes from the beginning of the book and we talk about religion um, so he says, Frome writes, suffice it to say at the outset that this popular picture of Marx's materialism, his anti-spiritual tendency, his wish for uniformity and subordination is utterly false. Marx's aim was that of the spiritual emancipation of man, for, of his liberation from the chains of economic determination, of restituting him in his human wholeness, of enabling him to find unity and harmony with his fellow man and with nature. Marx's philosophy was, in secular, non-theistic language, a new and radical step forward in the tradition of prophetic messianism. It was aimed at the full realization of individualism, the very aim which has guided Western thinking from the Renaissance and the Reformation far into the 19th century. So that is in many ways where Marx and Marxism in general also does kind of have roots in religion. So we think about the messianic tradition of, you know, the, the sort of fulfillment of humanity through Christ Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the, and, and so Marx is rejecting the sort of the God language and replacing it with humanity. And so the humanity is the end point and not God. That I think is extremely radical, which is part of the reason why people always sort of think of Marx's atheism as being kind of crass when in reality it's not. It's it's much more interesting than that. And um, like so, for example, when we talk about like um, like religion, we talk about it and the, and the what how would the end of religion happen? And with when Fromm's writing about it, he writes the religious reflex of the real world can in any case only then finally vanish when the practical relations of everyday life offer to man none but perfectly intelligible and reasonable relations with regard to his fellow man and Mm. to nature. And so what we're getting at there is that when you build a society where people's needs are met, where we're no longer alienated from ourselves, we're no longer alienated from others, and we're no longer alienated from our work, that we can truly begin the process of fulfilling who we really are and fulfilling the, 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 the highest potentials within ourselves. And And, sometimes, yeah. uh, And then sometimes that might mean that we stop looking up to uh, some uh, deity for answers, or it might mean that we find some other kind of spirituality with in the world, like, because we're now free to explore these things. 
And I'm with I'm with Carl Sagan on this, where where he said science. He's talking about science. Science is not antithetical to spirituality. In fact, it's a deep source of spirituality. If we're redefining spirituality is the way in which human beings relate to themselves, to others in the world, mm. where we take it away from a God centered view to humanity centered view. That is where I think we can develop a spirituality that is worthy of consideration and even celebration. Yep. Um, and so I think that's what Marx is trying to get at when he's writing about religion and writing about the reason why so many people buy into religions is because life is so shitty. Like life is so awful, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's that right. the only solace they have is in something else that yeah. is kind of untouchable. And, you know, maybe people could say the same thing about us when we argue for a social society. Maybe. But, you know, but it's an ideal worth fighting for. Like I can, and, and it's, and it's, it seems, and it's, yeah. ach- it seems achievable. It seems like a thing that can happen. <laughs> I don't know right. where, where I, I still am unconvinced that a, a deity can exist, but. Exactly. I'm not convinced a deity exists either, but what I am convinced of is the way that that idea, that central idea has been such a forceful concept in the history of humanity. Yeah. And it's going to be very, very hard to yeah. sort of get rid of it if yep. we ever do right? right because my thinking is if you argue for like a tolerant society free and open and flourishing society where people's needs are met that we have democracy in the biggest meaningful sense of the term that there will be people who are religious yep. and that's okay yep, but like that's right. I, I i'm kind of okay with that because at the end of the day what i care more about when it comes to religion is not so much the individual beliefs people have Although we can quibble about that and have those sure. philosophical discussions. Excuse me. What bothers me more is the way in which those beliefs then encroach upon the liberty of others. Yeah. And encroach upon the rights of children and specifically, you know, uh, you know, trans children. Um, the, 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 and the, and so they'll talk all the time about parental rights when at the same time, you know, parental rights for kids not to get vaccinated and be a public health hazard, which. Yeah. Which is like the peak of selfishness and sort of bourgeois individualism that sucks, um, and but no parental freedom and individual liberty for people to actively get the healthcare they need as trans people. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so like, there's there's those weird contradictions that exist that could only exist in a system like this, right. where where um, the, the the state is essentially captured by capitalism. Mm-hmm. You know, people think that like like the, the, the libertarians are right libertarians, not left libertarians, but right libertarians or conservatives have this like weird idea that like the market exists independently of the state, and if only we could get rid of the state, then the the map the cap the capitalism will be wonderful yeah. and everything will be great. Yeah, they really and don't like, understand how anything works. <laughs> they don't really get it. Like the way that you the way that you abolish the state is by developing systems of production and distribution and human flourishing that no longer require the state. Exactly. Like that's, that's yeah. the point. Um, you know, and so it's like, it's just so absurd when people talk about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Capitalism and the state have to exist together. It's just, <laughs> they have to, you can't get rid of one without getting rid of both. Exactly. Exactly. There was one other section where I want to, dive into because we've talked about alienation which is a key component of the economic and philosophical manuscripts so we've kind of covered that topic there's one other topic i really want to cover and in the the manuscripts marx writes a chapter on money okay and it's really interesting hmm. like i i because i've read a lot of capital i haven't read it all but i've read a lot of capital and obviously he describes like the commodity form and how money kind of develops naturally within the capitalist system and he does it in uh we already, yeah, and craps, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Smells like and crap. That's still one of your best titles for a video <laughs> or a podcast. Um, but what he taught, but this chapter in money, he's he's not just looking at it from the mechanisms of capitalism itself. He's also looking at it from a philosophical angle. Mm-hmm. Um, he talks about um, the meaning of private property, and this is me quoting Marx, the meaning of private property released from its alienation is the existence of essential objects for man as objects of enjoyment and activity. Money, since it has the property of purchasing everything, of appropriating objects to itself, is therefore the object par excellence. 
it's like the best object you could ever have because he yeah. can get you every other object. Yeah. Um, but here's where he gets even more interesting because we often think of capital, like as you, the sort of the myth of capitalism that like money gives you power and individuality and you can be yourself. But what Marx actually writes about is how money can strip you of your individuality. So he says that which exists for me through the medium of money, that which I can pay for, i.e., money, what which money can buy, that I am, that which exists through me through money is what I am, the possessor of the money. My own power is as great as the power of money. The properties of money are my own, the possessor's properties and faculties. What I am, am and can do is therefore not at all determined by my individuality. Right. So this is where he he he, he it's just so interesting where it's yeah it's he, like he, uh, uh <clears throat> we buy art that we think right. expresses who we are rather than creating art that and expressing ourselves <laughs> exactly and then and then money then and the possession of money then takes on as like the universal arbiter of morality so that's why we live in a system where like people pay attention to what bill gates says yeah. Because he has a lot of money, right. because we equate having a lot of money with being very moral, because you can essentially buy your morality. Yeah, It's a form of power. So Marx writes about this. It's so interesting. He writes, money is the external universal means and power, not derived from man as man or from human society as society, to change representation into reality and reality into mere representation. It transforms real human and natural faculties into mere abstract representations, i.e. imperfections and tormenting chimeras. See, he always has a good turn of phrase. People think <laughs> yeah. Marx is a dry writer. He's actually quite poetic at times. And on the other hand, it transforms real imperfections and fancies, faculties which are really impotent and which exist only in the individual's imagination into real faculties and power. This is brilliant. So let me get into why I think this is brilliant. You can essentially buy honesty. You can buy loyalty. Yep. You can buy trustworthiness. You can buy chastity. You can buy all the values that we as humans deem worthy, things that we consider moral precepts. You can essentially buy them with money. So you could be the worst person on planet Earth, but if you had a lot of money, it basically negates all of your horrible qualities because you can essentially use your money to create good qualities that then people have to then accept because of your money. <laughs> I'm not thinking of anyone in particular at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? Like, like, And we all have examples, whether they're recent or in history, of people who essentially buy their, their position or they buy yeah. their morality. Um, I think of somebody like um, Alfred Nobel, I think is a good example, yeah. right? Alfred Nobel came up with dynamite. And, and because he was guilt tripped from creating a, a, creating a thing of death, he, he starts the Nobel Peace Prize. Right. Like he creates the Nobel Prizes as a way with his money, the money he made from yeah. selling stuff that blows up and kills people and destroys shit. He uses that to buy this award that everybody holds in such high esteem. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's the same thing with the Pulitzer Prize. Joseph Pulitzer was a newspaper uh, owner who sort of proffered in yellow journalism that sort of led to the de degradation of American democracy and the body politic. He was not as bad as William Randolph Hearst. Hearst was much worse. But Pulitzer was pretty bad in and of himself, right? right. Where you lie, you can make up things, you could, you could create moral panics. Um, but somehow... Pulitzer but somehow, <laughs> the Pulitzer Prize, because he starts it right, it becomes this like, ooh, very esteemed. Like, yeah. you, have the, you have the Pulitzer Prize. You must be a noble truth teller. Noble truth teller, right? <laughs> when in reality, the guy who set up that award was like, you know, was like, exactly. And yet Obama, a war criminal, got a Nobel Peace Prize for being the less terrible president than the one before him. Exactly. Yeah. This is exactly right. So it's, and the thing is, you know who else has a Nobel Peace Prize? Teddy fucking Roosevelt. Like the guy who like pushed for the Spanish American war right. led to the deaths of thousands in that war. Like the, the horrific conditions of the Philippines, like he was imperialist par excellence, <laughs> got the Nobel peace prize. Yeah. 
And it's like, that's what I'm trying to say is that like money can buy you moral values that most of us don't have the wealth to cultivate. We have to cultivate on our own by being good people. <laughs> Terrible people don't have to cultivate any of those things because they have money. It's almost money, like being yeah. a bad person and being ultra wealthy go hand in hand. <laughs> yep. And I think this is where we, I mean, any bad virtue or any bad attribute can be disguised or neutralized by money. Mm. And any good attribute can be purchased by money. Yeah. So money becomes the God. That's why I keep trying to say in the system we live in, people don't worship Christ. People worship money. Yeah, that's right. Like money means so much more to people than Jesus because money can kind of buy them Jesus. Yeah, that's you know? right. Jesus doesn't have the power that cash has. That's well, like and the, I mean, it's like it's like we have modern indulgences, right? Like Exactly. Um, you buy your way into heaven for sure. Uh, some random geek says, I read a whole article on the real agenda of the Gates Foundation. Spoilers, a lot of imperialism. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, right? You know, using um, using vaccines in Africa, you know, that were deemed unsafe by German medical authorities, like real general medical, like real, you know, European medical authorities, not cranks, not anti-vaxxers, but people, they were like, these vaccines are not good. Yeah. We should develop. And they developed newer, better vaccines. But the Gates Foundation was like, well, let's go ahead and just, I don't know, let's try them out in Africa. You know, it's, that's my thing. And this is, and again, again, right? To have the level of like power that, that Bill Gates has to talk about this stuff, because he doesn't have a degree in health. He doesn't have a degree in climate science. He doesn't have a degree in anything. Yeah. He's just, because he doesn't guy. have a degree. Yeah. I have two more college degrees than Bill Gates does. Yeah. I also have two more degrees than Chuck Todd does, and he's also a moron. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, um, I actually, unlike Chuck Todd, I actually have a degree in political science. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm not just like a right wing hack piece of shit. But anyway, not to be. That's the real you. selling point. I'm not too big on the degrees, but. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, like, I, I just, it's, you know, and that's where my own elitism comes in. But I always like to make fun of Chuck Todd because Chuck Todd sucks. Yeah. And so does Bill Gates. Yeah. But right. So, like, this is the way, like, because Gates' wealth is so immense, it buys him a level of power that almost nobody could have in government. Yeah, you right. know, you can make an argument that Jeff Bezos is more powerful than the president of the United States. Like in a lot of ways, you can make that yep. argument, right? Yep. You can make an argument that Bill Gates is more powerful than the president. Um, because, you know, despite <laughs> how... Because in many ways, the president answers to them. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> like, right? Maybe like not the president a one-to-one, -one, whatever, but yeah, but in many ways. <sighs> That's exactly right. And so... You know, I think the other thing I wanted to um, mention at the end, we're talking about Marx's concept of man, but let's get a couple comments. Uh, we'll go with uh, some random geek says Gates approach uh, medicine and climate change like his businesses. And that is something to talk about. Remember when the government said that Microsoft is a mon was a monopoly. Yeah. Right. Yes. And, and the thing is, right. Like, 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago now, um, with Gates, um, he was on television every night looking like a fucking asshole during yeah. the antitrust trials. Yeah. So this whole, the last two decades have been him buying a reputation yeah. That's, and buying a good one. I liked the other comment. From yeah. Non, uh, non sequently non said, being overeducated myself, degrees are only what you make them and usually fairly useless and indicator of competence. <laughs> You're damn right. My go to to the my go to for this is that Ted Cruz graduated from Harvard. Yeah. All you need to know. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Uh that's all you need to know. But like George W. Bush graduated from Yale and Harvard Business School. Like that's all you need to know. Yeah. And so you're right. Like degrees almost mean nothing because you can buy them. You know, it's pretty easy when your daddy's the former president of the United States. Yep. Or in Ted Cruz's case, it's easy when like your dad is like a wealthy you know, you son of scumbag, but I've no, and I have no being to college that, and that surprised a lot of people talking. Yeah. Most of some of the most intelligent people I know, people are far more intelligent than me never went to college, you know, like, or go to school in general. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I was, I only make those wisecracks because I think Ted, uh, uh, 
Chuck Todd's a douchebag and he sucks, but that's, <laughs> but that's more of that's a, true. <laughs> cause he acts like he's such an authority when he's yeah. not an authority on anything. Yeah. Like that's the, you know, um, but I want to end tonight with, we've talked about Marx's concept of man. Let's mm-hmm. talk about Marx, the man. So there's this sort of myth about Marx as being this like mean kind of very, very stoic, angry guy he always looks very serious in pictures someone who never had a positive thought never never you know never was happy well what we learn about marx's real life is that marx was somebody who deeply loved his wife jenny marx who they were married for decades he deeply loved his children um and cared for his children very deeply and was good to them was a very um open and tolerant parent and he was somebody who cared so deeply about making the world a better place. And right. that's what animated him. I want to read to you um, a letter uh, a, a written by his daughter. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to read a part of it that I think is really important. And that is, um, he, she writes about how, who he was, how much he loved who he was, like how much he loved others, how much he cared about other people, how much he was really dedicated to people having better lives. Um, and was, was somebody who was, um, you know, deeply committed to the cause of human freedom. Uh, this is what Fromm said of Marx. And then I'll get to Eleanor Marx's quote. He said, Fromm writes, Marx was the productive, non-alienated, independent man whom his writings visualized as the man of a new society, productively related to the whole world, to people and to ideas. He was what he thought, which is really nice. But the, but the quick phrase that, 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 um, that his daughter, Eleanor Marx Aveling wrote, she said to those who are students of human nature, it will not seem strange that this man who was such a fighter should at the same time be the kindliest and gentlest of men. They will understand that he could hate so fiercely only because he could love so profoundly. And I think that's what animates us Mm -hmm. on the left. I think that people often say, oh, God damn, you guys, people, you look so angry all the time. You seem so so pissed off all the time. You're goddamn right I'm pissed off. (laughs) Injustice does that. (laughs) Injustice does that. Giving a shit does that it will make you angry right that's right and we are we hate so deeply because we love so profoundly and that's because we love the people in our lives we love humanity right i don't think marx is animated to do what he does if he didn't love humanity and i think and i think that and loved the human prospect and our capability as a people um and i think that that's what animates us as leftists i think it's that positive optimistic tone along with fierce indignation and anger. Yeah. Those two things go hand in hand. And so you have to have the hope. You have to have the joy. You have to have the optimism, but you also have to have the rage. Yeah. And, and, and the, 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 the sense, the deep sense of injustice. And Marx had both of those. Yep. And I think that, you know, reading this book and reading other things about him, he became much more of a human figure to me. Um, you know, in very much the same way that reading about Abraham Lincoln does, right. where you know Lincoln is seen as this sort of big, you know, you know the, the the big monument, and he's sort of seen like a secular saint. He's kind of godlike, when in reality he was a prairie lawyer from Illinois who never who got basically about a year's worth of schooling as a kid. <laughs> right. You know, he was somebody who, you know, had a tremendous amount of raw talent, and then molded that into doing something with it. Marx was the same way. I mean, Marx. I mean, the difference between Lincoln and Marx is Marx actually had a PhD. <laughs> We're talking about credentials again. P, uh, he wrote his dissertation, I think, on Epicurus. Okay. Um, but Marx was somebody who rejected the systems of accreditation and subjugation around him and said, I'm of the people. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I think that's for, for all of his faults, I think that's something worthwhile that we on the yeah. left, we should always consider ourselves of the people. Yeah. And that's what we strive towards. Um, so, yeah, so that's Marx's concept of man. There's a whole lot more in the book, but but we've covered quite a bit tonight. Nice. And I um, I think Eric Fromm is somebody that everybody should check out. I think he's a very interesting 
writer and thinker. Um, Chomsky doesn't think too highly of him, but I do. Um, and, sometimes, uh, sometimes Chomsky, Chomsky can just be a jerk. Like, just- I think so. I mean, I also think that his statement about, uh, Jeffrey Epstein was crap. Like yeah, him just saying right. it's none of your business. Like yeah. that's bullshit. You should have a better answer to that. Yeah. You've written 500 crap. page books on the inhumanities of Palestine. You could spend a few minutes talking about somebody you, you got money from who's a pedophile. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, you might want to take a second to do that again. This is, this is why it's important to, to, to not always, you, know, you got to tear down. We don't worship people. people. <laughs> that's, that's the whole point. No, that's why we don't, we do don't work. We don't worship people and your individuals, but for me and a spiritual prospect, it, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. Yeah. I, I guess for the listener instead of the viewer, yes. uh, <laughs> some random geek also says I don't. I also don't like Noam Chomsky's stance of being against the violence of Antifa. I uh, yeah. But yes, the only good hero is a sandwich. That is right. Yeah. Some that's random right. geek. That's right. Um, you get people you can be inspired by. You can sure. learn from. Yep. But it's important to not make them into something that they're not. Yeah, that's right. Um, and that's I think making a well-rounded figure. I mean, you know. Like Marx wasn't perfect either. I mean, he did love his wife deeply, but he also had an illegitimate child with their with their nanny. So it's <laughs> right, like, you know. So we're um, all flawed yeah. men. We're all flawed <laughs> people. You know that's what it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that that um, you know, and and you know, I I think I'm going to study more of Frome and maybe write something about it. There's been a lot of good writing on Eric Frome over the years. I think there's been sort of resurgence in people's interest in him. I think there's a book. The recent book that came out of him called "The Radical Humanism of Eric Fromm." Okay, I think excerpts of it are published in Jacobin that people can check out. Um, but yeah, read read either Marxist Concept of Man or read "The Art of Loving," which is one of his most famous books. That's about like different types of love and how love is an action and not a passive expression. And um, that sounds or "Escape from Freedom," which is his his analysis of totalitarianism. Nice. Um, so yeah, Fromm was was cool. Um, and so, yeah, so that's Marx's concept of man. Nice. So I guess, uh, what are we covering next time? So next time we will be covering, and that is a darn good question. I actually kind of forgot. <laughs> this is terrible. Let me give me a second. I'll pull it up. Uh, uh, cause I kind of forgot. I don't remember. Oh yeah. So next time we are going to be talking. So we're going to be talking about, We've talked about one of my passions in life, which is Marxism and, and left theory. But my other passion is Star Trek. Oh, and nice. so next time we're going to be talking about the really excellent book called Treconomics by Manu Sadia. Cool. And uh, so we're going to be talking all things Star Trek. I promise the listeners not to get too into the weeds on the canon <laughs> of Star Trek and to um, make it relevant. I think Manu Sadia has written a really interesting book. And makes a lot of the same arguments that Marx does in the idea of developing production and, and sort of creating a post scarcity society. Oh, some random <laughs> geek says, no, no, get into the weeds of Star Trek. Well, we're definitely, we're going to be devoting at least a solid hour to it in two weeks. So, um, we're, cause I've wanted to talk about Star Trek for a while. Um, and, and so this was a perfect avenue to talk about Star Trek. Right so on. that's what we'll be doing in two weeks. All right. And I guess the only thing left is where can people find your stuff? People can find me at justinclark.org. That's my website. That's where you can find everything. Um, I My newest article, which will be going up on it too. Um, oh, cool. Nice. I didn't know Steve Shives. Uh, Simran Geek says, in fact, Steve Shives used that book and another one for his video essay on the economics of Star Trek. Great. Great. That's very cool. Yeah, Sadia's book is very comprehensive. Um, it's not as radical as I'd like it to be, but it's but it's very, very good. I think it's very fair. Um, and interesting. Cool. Um, but yeah, people can find me at justinclark.org. Um, right. you can also find me at Justin Clark PH for public history. That's on me on Instagram. Um, that's really my only social handle. So I'm there. Um, and then I have a new article coming out in the truth seeker magazine in the May issue, which is a retrospective on Christopher Hitchens. God is not great, which we talked about in the previous episodes. Which will um, come out someday. Come out, it'll come out someday. <laughs> um, and uh, and then, um, yeah, and then, so yeah, you can check that out on my blog, and then it will be also in um, 
Uh, it is not as radical as I would like it to be. That is my stance on my friend Steve Shives as well. <laughs> there you go. But good on Shives. I mean, he's he's found a really interesting way to pivot his content. Because yeah. I remember years ago, he was kind of one of the atheist creators and then kind of pivoted and started to do other stuff. Yeah. Um, I remember when in the sort of the culture war debates of the atheist movement in the early 2010s, like – a lot of people in the atheist movement thought of Steve Shives as like the Antichrist. They like thought he was the worst yeah, because yeah, he was I remember like, that. I don't know, he was like defending because he was a feminist. People. Yeah, because he was a feminist <laughs> and like stood up for. You know, he's yeah. one of those people fighting back against the gamergate bullshit. Yeah, yeah, that feels like a fucking lifetime ago. I'll tell you, it basically um, was. Yeah, <laughs> it basically was. Um, so yeah, so that's where people can check out my stuff. And awesome. um, as I always do at the end of every episode, as or at least almost every episode. Um, is uh, definitely support uh, the Skeptical Leftist on Patreon. Um, I promise I'll put out content eventually. <laughs> my my dear friend and comrade, Corey, works very hard on all of this great content, and he makes it so much fun for me to do. So please support his Patreon. He's doing really interesting stuff. Go check out our live stream from a couple weeks ago. Yep. I want to get the numbers up on that live stream on YouTube, at least. Yeah. And... Also check out his excellent video essays going into anarchist theory. Great stuff. So I always, I, I just always want to give you the, the credit you deserve. My friend. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, right on. Well, thank you very much, Justin. And thank you to thank you. Uh, those who watched the stream and uh, have a good night. All right. That's all folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me survive, which is essentially the only way that projects like this can continue for me. If you want to contribute, you can do that at uh, patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical leftist. If you can't contribute financially, then a, a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check the show notes for links to all my stuff and to check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. There you can find the videos I do with my friend Damien Marie Atho and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast, Skeptarchy, and from my newly retired show, From, Ma from Many People's Strength. You can also find links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. You can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at skepticallefty. My Facebook page is the Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. And my Mastodon is collectiva.social slash at skeptical leftist thanks so much for listening and or watching and make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website uh join your local org print off some posters or pamphlets and uh spread the propaganda <laughs>